Are you in a band with a new album coming out? Are you an artist wanting more people to check out your work? Is there an event you want to promote? Do you own or run a company that sells a cool product or service? In Defense of Ska gets over 10,000 unique downloads each month. If you're interested in advertising on the podcast, we offer very reasonable rates and can help with the production of the ad. The ads are dynamic, meaning they will be placed on every episode for a given period of time. If you're interested, direct message us or email us at indefenseofska at gmail.com. Before joining indie rock heavyweights The Hold Steady, accordion slash keyboard player Franz Nikolai saw many a ska show at the Wetlands in New York. Not only that, but his early band World Inferno Friendship Society played with several ska bands, even toured with a few. Today we bring on Franz to talk about all the little pockets of ska that have brushed against his life over the years. We talk about music, touring, and his excellent novel, Someone should pay for your pain. Aaron, you listen to a lot of ska, but you also really like indie rock. I do, yeah. I And I kind of have ribbed you about this before when we've been in the car together. <laughs> You'll have on your your iPod or your or your, uh, your shuffle listening to music. And almost all of it is like stuff like the Hold Steady. Yeah, but it's a good amount of ska too. I just want to, I want to put that out there. Good amount of ska. And I think you probably just do that for me. You're just like, <laughs> oh, shit, I got op- to upload some ska. Oh, Adam's in the car. Yeah. Yeah. You caught me. Oh, no ska for Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I like sleepy indie rock, but you like heavy uh, hardcore and stuff. Yeah, definitely. Like there's a weird Venn diagram of our musical tastes and right in the middle of it, ska. That's right. Do you, Are you into indie rock at all? I mean, you got to like some of it, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, okay. The Hold Steady was one of those bands that uh, in the early days of Stereo Gum, they were getting a whole lot of hype. Mm-hmm. And so that that was kind of my my entry point was uh, like that 2006 era of Hold Steady. Yeah, so we got friends on the show and uh, he has ska roots, but it doesn't sound like the rest of the band does. No. And we'll get, we'll get into that. We find out. Yeah how the rest of the band feels about ska. You messaged me shortly after I released my book and uh, said that you never renounced ska. <laughs> no one ever asked me, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I wasn't a spokesperson. Yeah. <laughs> but your formative years, your formative punk years were spent uh, at the uh, Moon uh, Lookout Sundays at Wetlands. So let's hear about that. Yeah, I came sort of late to it because I grew up in really in the sticks um, in rural New Hampshire in the years before, you know, before the Internet. So um, I was a real rube when I got to, to, to New York. But my luckily, my one of my freshman year roommates at NYU was a Jersey punk ska kid and sort of took me under his wing as far as that went. He played in this sort of jokey North Jersey band called Heft with an umlaut over the E, of course. <laughs> what was your friend's name? Uh, Martin, shout out to Martin Olson. Shout out Martin Olson. He's still he's still around New York. People know him. So what what year did you move to New York? This was ninety five. And uh, what town did you grow up in, New Hampshire? Uh, called Center Sandwich, a little town of about nine hundred people in the Lakes region, right smack between the, the lakes and the White Mountains. Any idea how that town got its name? Yeah, uh, it's all the same sandwich. Um, it's it was property that was owned by the Earl of Sandwich for whom the, uh, the, the delicacy is named. Oh, he also wow. owned the, uh, the land that became sandwich, Massachusetts. It's, it's, it's all, it's all one. How are the sandwiches in town? <laughs> <laughs> there is a pretty good, uh, general store sandwich shop these days. There wasn't when I was growing up. I mean, there was a, there was a general store. That was my first job when I, when I was 15, pro- I mean, even younger, probably 14, 15, but that was just a straight up old school deli counter 
you get to the big city and Martin says, we're going, we're going to go to the Scott shows. Yeah. I mean, he was, he, he was, he was, I, I just, you know, learned from his record collection. I, you know, he was into, what was he into? He was into queers and Mr. T experience and Mel and Colin and, uh, and, and, and we would go down, he, we would go down to the wetlands and see those, those lookout shows and the, I mean, I remember seeing Slackers and Scofflaws and Sky Jazz Ensemble and Mephiscopheles was, I think, the the first live show that really blew my mind wide open. It's like, oh, holy cow, these guys are incredible. What happened at that show? I mean, anyone who ever saw Mephiscopheles, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have specifics. We're talking about 25 years ago. I just remember, sure. like, wow, these guys, you know, Satanic Scott for the whole family. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then... I was in the jazz program at NYU, and my buddy Rob Jost, who was the bass player, the first bass player in the band that I tried to, that I put together there, um, his main gig was for Scavuvi and the Epitones, um, and so he was sort of the one guy I knew. There was a drummer there who was in Harry Pussy, the noise band, but Rob was like the one guy I knew who was in a band, and I thought that was pretty cool. And I thought Scavuvi were were like a step above that crowd and turn like musically they had the, the the sort of the big band thing going and these these mm -hmm. yeah thick arrangements uh i was pretty into that i don't know that you know it became I, I i went a lot and that was sort of my first exposure to like oh there's this there's this whole world here and um and that these these pop punk bands and these ska bands are not are not you know it, it didn't even occur to me that they would have been separate um separate worlds it wasn't presented that way so was this like every Sunday sort of thing or just a frequently? I don't remember exactly. I think it was maybe one Sunday a month. Other people will know better. I mean, like, again, I was like, I was like very much the wide eyed country boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, pe people used to give me a hard time. I think I, I guess I had a pretty thick New Hampshire accent, too, at the time, which I cured myself of a lot of wicked, wicked this and wicked that. <laughs> you know, but then. You, uh, after I got out of college pretty quickly, I ended up in World Inferno Friendship Society, and that, that opened up a, a, a whole world, particularly of, of, you know, Jersey punk world. Uh, How did you wind up joining that band? I, total coincidence, um, I had, had an apartment in the East Village that I was getting, that I was losing, and uh, somebody was like, oh, you should, you should try this neighborhood Williamsburg. There, there's some people living out there, and I had never been on the... I had never been, probably had never been to Brooklyn. I certainly hadn't been on the L train. So I just sort of got off and, uh, at Bedford. And in those days, there was a big uh, bulletin board um, on the sidewalk where people would post the, the leaflets with the tear-offs, you know, rooms for rent. And so I grabbed a couple phone numbers and went to the payphone and, and called a few uh, and then walked over to wherever it was and, and ended up renting a room from Eula Berry um, and her then husband. Uh, she was the bass player in World Inferno. <laughs> and so I, I was subletting, I mean, literally their side room uh, for probably way too much money. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I met, um, I had met Peter Hess, who was the tenor, tenor sax and clarinet player in World Inferno. I had met him through an entirely separate, you know, like the music worlds in New York to turn out are, are not, not that huge once you once you start plugging into them. Um, he was playing sax in a band that I was playing guitar in, and I recruited him for this chamber music composer performer collective that I was putting together called Antisocial Music. And then um, one time I was just hanging out at, at, at Eula's place where I also lived you know, cooking spaghetti or whatever. And he came by and I said, like, Oh, you, what are you doing here? So, Oh, I'm recording these clarinet parts with Eula. We're in a band together. Uh, it's called world inferno. Uh, oh, that's interesting. And then, um, that first, you know, Halloween came around and you was like, Oh, my band's playing this Halloween, this big Halloween show. You should come. And I went by myself and that really blew my mind wide open. <laughs> Definitely never seen anything like that. That that would have been a Holomus two thousand. Um, and her her telling of it is that I didn't speak to her for a couple a day or two afterwards, and she thought, "Oh my god, he hated it." 
I think I was just hung over and probably couldn't <laughs> leave my room. Um, and then, but I, I said, that was amazing. You know, I play, I play keyboards and if you ever need anybody, uh, let, I, let me know. And she immediately went to Jack because I, they, they weren't happy with their keyboard player at the time. And, and, you know, within weeks I was in the band. When, when you think back to that show, what's, I know it was a while ago, but just what's the mental picture when you think about that show? So uh, men- the first mental picture was, was um, I didn't know the geography of Williamsburg that well at that point. And this was also before Google Maps, of course, and everything. Sure. So trying to find the venue on South First, people who know Williamsburg will know that like if you go down to South First in South Williamsburg, you run into the, I'm, I'm, again, like don't, don't have it at top of mind right now. It's been a long time since I lived there, but it doesn't connect. Like it, 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 there's a highway in the way. And so I got really lost trying to find the good, bad art collective. Um, but I found, I eventually found my way there. And, um, the first thing I saw was they had set up this, um, uh, gibbet, the cage that you hang from, from someplace and you would, you would put the pirate up there and let them starve to death and the body decompose. <laughs> Uh, they had hung a gibbet and Dan Bailey, the baritone sax player was up in there dressed as a zombie pirate. Um, and, and I went in and I saw, you know, luck, lucky. I think the guitar player was dressed as a, he was in a bee costume and Peter was in this Soviet army outfit and Jack was Jack and it was, he was blowing fire and Samra was setting fire to the symbols. And I was, I was just, I, I, again, kind of like with the Mef Scoffley's experience, I had just never seen anything like it. Um, and then, yeah. And then, and then, and then joined the band a few weeks later, essentially. Nice. I mean, this was this was also a band that had a three piece horn section, and we played in suits. So, the, well, I would never call it a ska band. Other people definitely did. <laughs> yeah, any any time you have a horn section, people want to try to claim that it's ska. At that point in time, for sure. I mean, we had a couple of ska songs, like "Night in the Woods" is a ska song. Our candidate is a ska song. Dan had fronted a ska band down in Denton, Texas, called the Grown Ups before he came to to Williamsburg. You know, we were ska friendly, but it definitely, it definitely right. had a lot more to do with Dexy's Midnight Runners and Oingo Boingo than it did than it did with ska bands. Yeah, and our and our first U.S. tour was was opening. The first band that took us on tour was the Blue Meanies. If I don't know where they sit in your in like within the genre, oh, we claim for you guys. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I've read many interviews of World Inferno, mostly mostly of Jack, and it seems like the question of Ska comes up, and he has to clarify that the music that they're playing is not ska. Well, you're talking about the aughts, which was the time I think of the the deepest ska <laughs> backlash, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, definitely in World in Front of Van was a, was definitely a ska friendly zone, um, but there was a lot of you know keep keeping it quiet depending on who you were talking to, I think. And, <laughs> and again, like people would look at world Inferno and like, what's the, what's the popular template for a nine piece band in suits with, with, with a horn section. Oh, they must be a ska band. So yeah. what are you, what are you going to do? I, I think it wasn't, it wasn't so much being defensive about that as being defensive of like, of, uh, or setting, um, making sure that people understood what they were getting into. I think it's it's uh it's a it's a a different kind of frustration. It's like you, your influences are different and it's hard for people to understand. They don't have much nuance because like Adam said, horns kind of fun, upbeat equals ska, but that's not what defines ska. Absolutely. Yeah, by no means. And you you and uh, the the kind of stuff that were was influencing your band was this whole world of music out there that's horn driven and upbeat and all this and this and that, but not ska. Right. North Northern soul a lot more, but also it, it, again, it's like, it's hard to put your bat, your mind sometimes back in the mindset of, of a pre streaming era where people's ears were just not as big because you had to make such an investment to hear different kinds of music. Um, you know, I, 
I'm just amazed at the kind of things, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a college professor now, so I'm, I'm dealing with, with 19, 20 year olds. I'm amazed at the, 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 the breadth of music that they're familiar with and exposed to because it's all the entire history of recorded music is essentially available. And that just wasn't the case. And so people, you know, if you had never heard of Oingo Boingo, or if you're, if all you knew of Dexys was come on Eileen or, 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 you know, you'd never heard of Kurt Vile or uh, any of the other, you know, touchstones for world inferno um you just sort of went for the easiest uh visual analogy <laughs> let's uh we're going to come back to world world inferno i've got a lot of questions about world inferno but i have a few other just sort of general let's let's talk some general ska stuff sure you were uh you played on ska dream you were on i think pick it up right i don't remember exactly what the titles ended up being but if if you say so that's if you say that's the one that's the one it's the one with angelo yes which i was thrilled about okay so that's another i should i i the first not the first live show i ever went to uh, the first one i went to by myself was um or like uh, was with uh I must whatever the lollapalooza was that fishbone was on 93 probably with my buddy mm -hmm. ken and another experience where you fishbone came on and you know i had i think the only shows i've been to at that point were u2 on the octung baby tour and then the that p package tour uh with uh it was like soul asylum spin doctors and the screaming trees so i didn't i also didn't have like a huge <laughs> bank of references to to make sense of fishbone coming on stage um but another experience where it's just like completely blew my mind wide open and i remember me and ken coming home and sort of making the list of the bands we had seen and we were going to go to the record store and you know he would buy these one two you know the rage against the machine record and the whatever rec the mercury rev record and i would buy the fishbone ep and we would tape them for each other and um yeah so to be on a track with 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 angelo was was a real thrill for 15 year old me what did you do specifically on that track? I played a piano solo. What happened on that was me and Ara, Ara Babajan, uh, drummer of the Slackers and ex Leftover Crack, uh, were working on New River, my record that just came out uh, at Atomic Garden in Oakland. And um, uh, Jack Shirley and, and Rosenstock were mixing Sky Dream um, in the other room there. Uh, Jeff was mixing it on. Uh, zoom or facetime <laughs> you know he was on the he was on the phone um and he's old buddies i like i he's old buddies with ara he's a big slack slackers fan and i've known him since like asob opened for world inferno at least once um uh and i knew him from the bomb days and so he's like oh hey you guys i'm working on this record you know do you want to you want to play on it and he sent over a track and ara played some played some cymbal stuff and i played you know i did like three takes of this piano solo and then and he was like, whatever you guys are working on, send me a couple tracks if there's anything that, uh, that I can do on it. So I sent him, I sent him two tracks, uh, and he did some great, great stuff, horns and horns and guitar and, and yelled on, there was, there's one of his lines, uh, lines that I had always loved from the bomb track, sad or weirder that I, I filched for one of my songs. So I sent him that, sang along with that. Um, anyway, that's how that came to be. Did Mike Huguenor uh, play? He, he contributed? Yeah, he played guitar on a, several tracks. He was one of those guys. I moved out to Berkeley a few years ago. My wife had gotten a job at Cal. Uh, and I didn't really know anybody in the Bay Area. I mean, I had a list of people that I knew pretty well, or like not, not pretty well, just sort of acquaintances from rock world, essentially. But a lot of people I knew had moved out of the Bay Area because it wasn't, it's just not that friendly to, creatives uh, at that point a lot of people had moved to sacramento or they'd moved up to the pacific northwest but uh jeff he i guess it must it was either when laura opened for a hold steady show or when or when jeff did um i told him i was moving out there he was like oh you should connect with mike huguenor you guys i think have a lot in common you know you're both book people like literary people um <laughs> and so i reached it i mean it's true you know yeah yeah I know uh, Mike. Yeah. yeah. So, so we met up and sure enough, hit it off. Um, I immediately filed it away of like, oh, next time I do a record, 
Uh, and Mike's Mike's solo record, I really liked. I thought it, it was super interesting. Um, this like indie rock, Sonny Chirac kind of thing. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, um, it's just like, you know, obviously this is a guy who has like a really interesting musical mind um, in addition to being, you know, smart and intellectual and, and curious. So that those are always the kind of people that I like to work with. So I immediately put filed that away of, of you know, if I next time I do a record, I got to get Mike to come and to come and play on it. Um, you know, and then pandemic logistics being what it was, I ended, I recorded it with, you know, a real stripped down rhythm section of, of with Ara on drums and, and Frank Pagaro from Warriors and star fucking hipsters playing bass and then and sent sent the tracks over to Mike essentially anything you think you know go to town on it fuck it up go nuts and and he did like both the you know, the the squalling noise stuff in the middle of the, the the jazzier track and then these very sort of beautiful uh uh melodic stuff on some of the other tracks great musician so you're you know you, you've worked with the uh, rf for a while on different things been friends with him for a while i love ara he's one of my best friends um again like books book people in the rock world we gravitate towards each other he told us uh he told us that that's uh how he that's how he passed the time on tour is reading books yeah i mean i did too once so i started touring with world inferno in 2001 i think was the first tour and you know the first couple of years of touring it's so exciting you're going to places you've never been to before meeting people you know there's a lot of partying you're in, especially in that band a lot of chaos and and hijinks and um but you know after your second or third or fourth time at a place the excitement of that wears off and then especially once i was really intensely on the road with the hold steady um you start looking for other things to do with your day um and one of those things for me was was going to use bookstores and and particularly especially in those first couple of years I'm thinking of like 05 06 um I was picking up, you just go through phases. I went through a Graham Greene phase. I went through an Elmore Leonard phase. You know, these books that are widely available in used bookstores, but are also, you know, give you, you uh, give you a, a reliable, you, you know what you're getting and you know that it's going to be good. Um, and then I started picking up old showbiz biographies um, uh, or memoirs, you know, sort of old actors, vaudevillians, performers from the, the teens 20s 30s um just to sort of as by way of making sense of my this life that i wasn't then living and s planned on doing living for some time if i could make it happen you know being away from you know life at home was going on without with, without me uh, my f you know friends were moving on with their lives um and 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 i was trapped in this i was in this in this van um and so that i it helped to feel that I was part of a, of a, of not that, not that I was just sort of this molecule floating from town to town, but that I was part of a lineage of traveling entertainers. Um, that these, you know, these stories of Gypsy Rosalie or Jimmy Durante or whoever going town to town doing the vaudeville shows um, were essentially the same experience. Um, and that that added up to a meaningful life as a performer. Hmm, interesting but we were talking about ara so <laughs> I, I met ara as the drummer of leftover crack sure. um uh and then i you know i i had an intermittent but sustained uh, leftover crack a, a extended universe uh existence for some time um you know i played on fuck world trade and then sturgeon would call me up whenever they were doing a thing, be like, Hey, come play on these, you know, such and such songs, blah, 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 bring your keyboard. Or like if he was calling it choking victim, that would sometimes that too. And then on the, the first star fucking hipsters record that Ara was on and Eula was on and Frank was on. Um, and then Ara was spent a, a brief period in world Inferno, I think or like Oh nine, 2010, uh, before really committing to the slackers. Um, and then I didn't see him for a while, but reconnected with him uh, on some of my solo records, and and you know, especially as as 
middle-aged rockers, <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot in common. Um, and uh, it's always a treat to, I'm always looking for an excuse to spend time with him, whether it's making a record or not. Were you on the track, uh, soon we'll be dead. I sure was. Was I ever, it was recorded at my apartment. You, did you play keyboards or was it just vocals? I was not on vocals. The vocals are Sturgeon and Terry Cloth. Okay. Hess played, I think, clarinet or something. I haven't heard the track in an extremely long time. Um, I played accordion. I might have played some keyboards, but definitely accordion. Um, yeah, that was Jesse, Jesse Cannon, the engineer. Uh, and, and Sturgeon came over to my place in Bushwick, and, and we tracked it there. Um, I'm, I've always been a little perplexed at the enduring popularity of that song. <laughs> Something about the, <laughs> the, just because I'm a grammar pedant, the line soon will be dead, our brains and our heads. I, I just thought was a total, uh, <laughs> it was a, absolutely appalling lyric. <laughs> There were other things I really enjoyed and respected about about the whole leftover crack experience, but but uh, I never thought that was one of their standout songs. Not that lyric. Not that lyric. And then, uh, so I know you're you're on the Two Cups of Tea song as well as the video. Yes, uh, the video was made by this guy Nicholas Chatfield Taylor, who was sort of he he was around World Inferno shows for a couple of years, uh, and they filmed it at Sea Squat. I, for whatever reason, I couldn't make the main filming date, um, but they didn't. But they wanted me to be in the video, so I came over separately, and and Nick filmed it and put me on that TV. Yeah, but I had this whole—I don't know. This was one of those dumb sort of. I always walking into things with concepts, and I was treating it like I was on stage, and I had this whole routine where I was like tipping my cap and taking a shot of whiskey and doing the harpsichord solo and blah, blah, blah. And uh, none of that made it into the video. But the result was that after however many takes of it, I was fucking hammered. <laughs> I walked out and I walked out of C-Squat and immediately vomited into a trash can. It was, it was not, a, not one of my finer moments. So the little clip that exists, because you kind of like are playing and then you look at the camera and get like a weird expression. Yeah. Is that because you're, is that because you're wasted? I mean, probably <laughs> again, like I haven't seen this video in probably 15 years. <laughs> okay. So last year you were interviewed by GQ on the, uh, is sublime cool now, uh, con uh, article. Yeah. Uh, which, which mentioned my book, which was funny because my book doesn't really talk about sublime except to say that I think the song date rape sucks. Um, so I appreciate the shout out. <laughs> well, your book was one of the, uh, I, I feel like was one of the, the, the touchstones of the, you know, yeah. everybody writing about Scott for a summer. Right. Sure. Yeah. So you were, you, you said, no, I don't think sublime deserves to be cool again. And you said that they are the band equivalent of a Bob Marley tapestry on a door room, dorm room wall. Yeah. I stand by that. <laughs> I mean, look, at there, you know, it's a generational thing, right? Like people, people get to their early thirties or whatever, and they start taking the reins as, you know, editors at these culture um, outlets, and they're looking for things to to you know, people start pitching them. They're looking for things to write about, and it's I I understand the impulse to revisit the enthusiasms of your youth um and and maybe rehabilitate some of them and that that's constantly happening and it, you know i understand why that happens from a media ecosystem point of view but i don't think it's always justified from a musical point of view i yes. mean whatever like that's just my prejudices sure. you know you know i was i've spent a lot of time in bands with with people who are 5 or 6 years older than me and so for example you know I was enthusiastic about ska in the nineties, uh, but hold steady guys were a little old, you know, were a little too old for that. And so I sort of kept that to myself, but now, you know, I see a similar thing about myself looking at people who are, you know, five, seven, 10 years younger than me have their own, you know, enthusiasms that I don't understand, like astrology and professional wrestling, you know, 
whatever. Uh, it's just part of the nature of things. Side question. Where does Craig Finn stand on ska? I think he's basically not a ska enthusiast. Okay. But you'd have to, I wouldn't want to speak for him. Okay. I think most of the indie rockers I've met of that, that roughly generation were, were basically ska skeptics. It's certainly 90s ska skeptics, with the exception of Ted Leo. Good old Ted. Yes. <laughs> Good old Ted. I mean, some of where I'm coming from is that I am also an indie rock enthusiast. And that's why I never understood why my two passions were to ever meet in the night. Well, I have, a th- I have one theory about it, which is that so much of the aesthetic of that 90s indie rock thing was about not dressing up. Sure, okay. Right? Yeah. So, like, the, the, <laughs> the dressing up for that generation of people was, you know, whatever, whatever junky thrift store clothes they went to sleep in and, and pretending that they weren't performing. And this is the this is the attitude that always drove me absolutely berserk about it as someone who's like, I believe in performing. I believe like there's an authenticity in the performance. Yeah. And and I also believe in like not acting like you're not trying. <laughs> you know, I'm like sort of an anti- intense and ambitious and and hands on guy. And so these like, oh, I'm not. Are, am I on stage? Oh, I'm just, you know, I'm not even I just. I'm improvising this song or like, Oh, this song, I, I'm not even trying made me a- absolutely crazy. Um, but I think if the, if you had internalized that aesthetic to look at, uh, groups that were openly enthusiastic about what they were doing, <laughs> for example, um, was just uncool. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So you, you were voted by dying scene as the number one punk rock accordion player. Mm hmm. Which I guess is, you still hold this title since it hasn't been. They haven't had another tournament. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of my most treasured, uh, I don't know, bullet points on my CV. You even, uh, uh, you outranked uh, both Eugene and Yuri from Gogol Bordello. Well, Eugene doesn't play accordion, so. Yeah. Well, he, I mean, he was on the list. I don't, you know, I don't know whatever why. reason. <laughs> <laughs> They're just guessing. Like, it looks like he plays yeah. accordion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I earned it, you know? Yeah. I think you earned it, although I'm going to say this is a controversial opinion. I think there should be a rematch with you and Weird Al. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll ex- I'll accept that. Because I feel like Weird Al is a punk at heart. Yeah. And he's one hell of a accordion player, so. James Fernley, you know, give it up also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure, Weird Al, absolutely. What's not to like? <laughs> I will say I went to I went to see Weird Al recently. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I had never seen him before. Um, but he's you know respect. You know, I, I I interviewed Lily Hirsch who wrote this academic study of Weird Al, and it really got me thinking about him in a way that I hadn't before. And he was playing in Poughkeepsie. My wife and I we. Just thought we we should we should go. This guy's a show business legend. I love going to see show business legends. You know, almost, just from a, a professional curiosity. Sometimes too, you know, you want to see how do they come on stage? What's their walk on situation? Like how does how does the show work? And my and I think we were a little disappointed. You know, with caveats. I think it was the first day of a very long tour that had been. Um, that had been postponed by the pandemic. Uh, he was playing all his, all all originals, his originals, mm-hmm, and you know yeah. he's famously like a, a he wants to get it right. Um, and I think my impression was that he was anxious about the show. He you know, like obviously hadn't settled into the the groove of it, and and that's probably some of the enjoyment that he projects later in a tour. Um, wasn't wasn't quite there yet i didn't get to see him on the the tour you're talking about but i saw him right before the pandemic it was the same concept he was doing the original so this is like part two of it but i've also seen him a handful of times in classic form where it's all the parody hits the huge production i gotta say that the classic form is the best the my top show i've ever seen because it is the most entertaining live show I have ever seen. It's like two hours long. It's got costume changes. It's got 
video clips in between songs, sometimes at the same time. It's like, I've, I did not feel bored one second and uh, never felt like I needed to look at my phone. It was like so thoroughly entertaining. Like talk about a person who understands that they're entertaining and performing and really gets what people want. Yeah, I've heard that about the about the big production show. I should I should probably give it another another shot. The original stuff, uh, I th- I liked it, but it was definitely not at all comparable to the classic, you know, parody production. Mm-hmm. I can see how that might have been a little disappointing for your first time. <laughs> yeah, I got the impression too that he kind of was doing that for like because he's got some hardcore hardcore fans oh my god i mean the the fan base watching was incredible this i don't think this has really been talked about enough i feel like this is this is the topic for a really good article you talk about uh diehard fans weird al has the most diehard fans they'll go to every year they know his material backwards and forward i think he was kind of doing it for them like you know they've seen him every year they they are debating his you know the, the, the his different material online. So this is more like a here's deep cuts for you. I don't think it was for the first timer for the like weird Al curious. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Well, good for him. You know, I respect. I have a lot of respect <laughs> for him. <laughs> My kids are into him now. You know, they haven't quite. They you know, a nine year old and a six year old. They 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 immediately get it. They don't know anything about the originals. But they've sort of imbibed this idea that there's a Weird Al version of every song that they're familiar with, which I, I was ashamed to disabuse them of that in the sort of way that there's like a kids' bop version of all the hits that they know. They're like, <laughs> where's the Weird Al version of this? Like, oh, sorry, you know, <laughs> we can listen to Hamilton Polka again. So we're, uh, World Inferno, uh, you said your first tour was Blue Meanies. Um, yeah. We're, we're, we are friends with Blue Meanies, and uh, w- one of their members, Sean, he gave me their tour diary. He just it was, we were just ha- happened to be in a conversation about unrelated to World Inferno because it was the, it was their last tour because they they basically fell apart during that tour for a number of reasons. One of them being that their label dropped them. One of their members quit. Uh, I mean, those are the main reasons. <laughs> That'll e- either one or both will do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was re- so he sent he's like you want to read this and I was reading it and I, this is. Before I was even preparing for this interview, and I saw, oh, World Inferno joined this partway through this tour somewhere, like I think in the South or East Coast or something. What did he say? I'm dying to know. There was one. So Billy, the the singer in the Savannah show, talked about um, Jack blowing fire and telling the audience, "I shot Reagan, and I'll do it again and again." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, he used the Suicidal Tendency song as an intro to uh, the song, our song, Secret Service, Freedom Fighting USA. So there's a whole story, which everyone's heard, who who knows the band, has heard a million times, so I won't tell it here. And uh, the other thing about that tour, I'm curious your perspective, that tour is just fraught with illness. Like, everyone, according to this diary, everyone caught the flu, um, dropkick Murphys were, were on the headliners, and was like hospitalized. The bass player was hospitalized from the flu briefly. Billy was like extraordinarily sick. Do you remember, did you guys get sick on that tour? I got sick on every tour. (laughs) I mean, really, I'm not exaggerating. That's just part of being sick. Uh, I mean, part of being on tour, especially at that level, you're just, you're, you're, you know, with World Inferno, it's like you're rolling 10 deep. And you're sleeping, you're showing up at somebody's house. Like, no, you're, you're sleeping on a floor. I mean, you're really sleeping on a floor <laughs> and in a room with eight other people. So you're never getting enough sleep. Everybody was drunk all the time. You know, we, were, we would start passing the bottle line around in the van. I'm not saying that to, to brag or, or whatever. That's just the way it was. Um, to sound romantic. Um, uh, <laughs> and so just you know, your immune, immune system was absolutely decimated. Uh, and then, you know, you're in a room full of strangers every night. So of course, of course you're sick. I I don't remember, I I don't remember any tour being more, uh, fraught with sickness than any other. It's funny about people's tour diaries though. Like we did years later, we did a a tour with TV Smith from the adverts 
and he publishes his tour diaries once he accumulates enough in these this ongoing series and i i bought the one uh that dealt with that year and this was you know almost a decade later and his entry for world inferno was you know world inferno there's 10 of them they'll never make any money <laughs> <laughs> which is jesus you know tv you could you could have you could have tipped us off yeah. <laughs> we still thought we had a chance <laughs> Damn. What did you think of the Blue Meanies? Did you have any experience with the Blue Meanies before that? I didn't. I thought they were amazing. I mean, again, like I was still sort of wide-eyed at everything. Yeah, I don't have any anything pithy to say about it. Uh, great band. Yeah, uh, great, great horn players, too. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like a similar, like, not that there are that many bands who did what World Inferno did, especially at that time, but they weren't that far away. Yeah. You guys make sense together. Yeah. Absolutely made sense. You know, I'm trying to think of other, you know, the Kings of Nothing, I guess, if you remember that band from Boston, we're doing sort of a similar thing. Mm-hmm. Um, not that many. I mean, people didn't have horn sections at that, at that point. This is 2001, early 2001, yeah. this tour. Later that year, 9-11 happens. Yeah. We were in Germany. Oh, okay. And I think... Not too long after 9-11, you guys play in New York, and you invite Eric and Sons of Bitches to play open for you. Is that true? It's true in that Jeff told me for my book that before 9-11, they kind of had a little bit of a hiatus. They were kind of not taking it too serious. You know, the band was kind of losing some steam. And then there was, you know, 9-11 itself had sort of an impact on him. but then. You guys inviting them to open for them also was a was a kick in them to be like, this is an awesome show. We got to play this show to kind of get their stuff together. That's cool to hear. I don't remember that one. I remember them opening for us in Long Island. I'm looking at my show history, but that was years later. Mm-hmm. I think. I mean, I I think that was 2000. Were they? It couldn't have been 2006. They were broken up by then. Mm-hmm. They kind of slowly broke up. So um, they, there's a chance they open for you. They they still kind of petered out with some reunion shows and some, we still need to pay off our credit card shows. I think maybe somebody who's listening to this can confirm. I see here that World Inferno played the Crazy Donkey in Farmingdale in 2006. And I, in my mind, ASOB opened for that show, but I could be quite wrong. But that's nice of him to say that. I will say in return that um, there have been in my life two bands that I, that I sat down and wrote a fan letter to, uh, people that I didn't know, but I just thought their records were so good. Uh, and the first one was to Against Me after I heard uh, Reinventing Axl Rose. Um, mm-hmm. I wrote a letter and sent it to, to No Idea. Um, and the second one was uh, to Bomb after after. Uh, my friend Emmeline gave me a copy of Scrambles, uh, and I was just like, "Wow, this is incredible!" You know, it was the first it was the first record that had given me that feeling in in a in a bunch of years, um, and and I just emailed cold emailed Jeff and um, and got a really nice response, and ended up playing a couple shows uh, with them, not not in the band, but like my solo act opening for them, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't really know Jeff, even though ASOB opened for um, World Inferno. No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't put it together that he was the same guy until much later. Mm. I thought I thought Bomb was was this new band. Uh, I I I I didn't connect it um, to ASOB until later. Yeah, Scrambles was actually my entry point to Jeff's music. I um, I had that had it had that effect on me too. My friend Bob showed me the record and I couldn't believe just how disjointed it was, but how well it worked Mm -hmm. and how they, how he would just wedge in like Scott, like a ska verse or just an electronic break or whatever made no sense at all. Uh, And it was like, so it was done so deliberately and almost like defiantly. Um, But it like did end up working perfectly. Yeah, I mean he's a great composer. Yeah. Uh, the, the the track that got me was Fresh Attitude Young Body because it has that piano rock thing 
yeah that yeah. is core obviously in all kinds of ways to my musical identity so uh, <laughs> um so I, i'm always happy to hear people doing that um and that was just it's just such an exciting track i mean it was just makes you want to like punch through the ceiling <laughs> i did a i was on a, a solo tour around it couldn't have been much more around must have been around that time and i was doing a guest dj thing down in charlottesville this like sort of perfectly nice you know rock station and i put that song on because i thought i i had sort of come to assimilate that song as like basically a, a pretty straightforward springsteen holds daddy-esque song with rock song with piano on it but i guess it does get pretty blown out towards the end and uh and they're they're they got some complaints and the djs was like whoa what was that, that sort of thing <laughs> i got in trouble <laughs> wow i know that's weird that song sounds so normal to me too yeah i mean in, especially in the context of his catalog it's pretty accessible i guess we we have a different barometer yes like our 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 normal our, our normal line is like probably way over here and so that's like, oh, we're on the we're on we're over here. It's it's right on normal. Yeah. So 2002, World Inferno. You guys went on tour with um, the Independents. Oh my God, boy, have I got yeah. I I've seen Independents play. I actually saw them play in their la- uh, with Joey Ramone. Yeah. Which was the last. Are they still at it? Yep. I have no idea, and we haven't really talked about them much on this podcast, but. Uh, I think they're a good band. So let's hear let's hear your independence stories. So this was probably the most ridiculous, which is really saying something. This was the most ridiculous Inferno tour of of my time in the band. Um we did a tour. It was a U it was a full US tour, but it was in different legs. And the first leg was about ten days from New York to New Orleans. And we did it as a package. It was World Inferno, it was the Independence, and it was the Robocop Kraus from Germany, the, uh, this band that were our friends from there, who went on to become pretty popular over there and came back to the States opening for Art Brute when Art Brute was a headline act. Um, they, anyway, they never, they never really broke through in the States. Um, they were cool, though. They were, they were really like kind of weird, angular stuff i mean very much in that in uh that of their time like suits and skinny ties yeah. and and angular guitars and sort of like if you like the hives you would probably like robocop sure. Krauss. although robocop Krauss had much better lyrics uh, they were re- actually really great lyrics considering it was a english as a second language band yeah um those yeah those records are i would encourage anyone to to revisit those or visit them for the first time um but they had never been to the united they had never toured the u.s before um and they were sort of like clean cut, nice German boys. Um, and they had, especially their, their merch guy that they brought with them was, was very wide eyed <laughs> and very shocked <laughs> by everything he was seeing. Um, how do, how we connected with the independence was Samra, our percussionist was dating this guy who was playing bass for them at the time. And so she was like, Oh yeah, you know, We'll we'll hook up with the independents. They'll headline in the south. We'll headline in the north. It's going to be awesome. They say they do really well down there. Well, that was not the case. <laughs> um, uh, but I will say this for them: they partied like they were Motley Crew. I mean, they acted like they were Motley Crew. Uh, you know, they were like Myrtle Beach people, and this they had this guy playing this much older guy. He seemed much older at the time. He was probably in his forties maybe early fifties um, had this like long black dyed black ironed straight hair, black leather pants. He was playing keyboards and, and maybe extra guitar. They called him grandpire. Uh, um, and, and it was, and they all, and he was, I think a DJ at a strip club in Myrtle beach, <laughs> like strippers in Myrtle beach was seemed like it was very much their scene. <laughs> uh, you know, we would roll into a town and like a couple of like stripper looking girls would come backstage and they'd have a huge bottle of Jack Daniels and blah, blah, blah. And then they'd, they'd go out and rock for six people. <laughs> I mean, it was really, it was awesome in, in a way, <laughs> you know. So we had a three band bill. I mean, it was probably 25 people traveling in the three vehicles and playing for crowds. You know, it, it'd be a dozen if we were lucky. It, and But 
you know, independents were hard partying in their way. World Inferno was hard partying in a very, in a very different way. Um, and the Robocops were just trying to, uh, they were just looking on being like, is this what American <laughs> touring is like? You know, <laughs> what the hell's going on here? What is a World Inferno's hard partying style? Well, like I said, you know, we'd, we'd roll out of somebody's house in the morning. Jack didn't really travel with a suitcase. He had a briefcase um, that would have like a bottle of something and a comb and maybe his laptop, you know. And so my mental image of Jack waking up in the morning on tour would be like sitting on a curb outside of some somebody's suburban house and just sort of like deep sigh and opening up the briefcase and like taking a, a swig of whiskey. And then we would all pile into the van and crack open a bottle of wine for the drive. Um, you know, we were traveling. So also on this tour, we were traveling with a nine piece band. Our buddy Gunnar, who was our driver in Germany, uh, had come over, but he hadn't bothered to, there was something about he didn't feel comfortable driving in the United States or he hadn't gotten his international driver's license or whatever. He had come over to drive, but he couldn't drive. So he was just hanging out. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we had these two guys, Greg Daly and Ryan Burse, um, high school buddies uh, who were two of the first like people who really were around, who weren't in the band, but were around all the time. We called them the chaos coordinators. Um, Ryan had like, sh you know, head shaved, but, a, you know, long bunch of dreadlocks down to his ass, uh, you know, sort of like uh, cross punk uh, cargo pants. Um, and he was he was along for the ride and he was going to fly from New Orleans to Thailand. And then he was going to go hang out in Thailand for a while. Um, and he was one of the auxiliary fire breathers. So he would come along and do fire tricks. And um, and he had also, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a second. And then Greg, Greg is still in the game, actually. He's, he's gone professional now. He's like a, he's like a, he's a punk, punk rock pro tour manager for Napalm Death, um, you know, Philadelphia legend, uh, you know, ab vibes coordinator for the stars. Um, great guy. Anyway, so Greg ended up driving. Gunnar and Ryan were in the were in the van. So we had what what how is it? That's twelve people in a in an Econoline. In a fifteen passenger van. Fifteen passenger van, but with the back two seats taken out because it had everybody's suitcases. And in World Inferno, it was like not just the suitcases, but also your suit bags. Wait, so then also were you pulling a trailer or no trailer? Also the gear. So the gear's also in the van. Also in the back. You're all yes. savages. Wow. Yeah. So so half of the van is taken up with, with suitcases, suit bags, and gear. And so we have two bench seats and the two front seats. So it was, let me see if the math is right. We would squeeze four people into each of the bench seats. Oh, my God. One driver, one shotgun, <laughs> one person sitting on the floor between driver and shotgun facing backwards. Oh, fuck. And then two people sitting on suitcases in the wheel well. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we did a full U.S. tour this way. Oh. <laughs> um, and so the other, the other characters that we should introduce here were this group called the Know Nothing Family Circus, um, who were, you know, it, in the, the cir circus punk was particularly a thing in the nineties and beyond, right. There was the Jim Rose circus. And then there were a bunch of these, um, touring, you know, cross punk circuses of various kinds. And the know nothings were one of them. Um, there's a pretty good book about it. Uh, I think it's called freaks and fire about that, that whole world. But this was this, this circus, uh, that we had sort of, they were, they were simpatico. They were buddies and, and Ryan had toured with them. Um, he had a, he had a, he had a, dick piercing and so his act was like he would take out the piercing and he would and he would pretend to be nailing his dick to a two by four he would put it you know put the 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 nail through the hole and then nail it into a two by four and, and yank it out and <laughs> blah 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 and then uh, then then he would sort of he would put a straw through the hole into a 40 and invite someone from the audience to come up and like 
have some have some of the 40 through this straw through his dick um but for <laughs> us he was the fire eater um but so the 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 day 10 or 10 or 11 or 12 of this tour uh was was new orleans uh which was home base for the know nothings um and then and then ryan was gonna and then the the the, the independents were gonna go home to myrtle beach and the uh the robocops were gonna fly home to germany and um and ryan was gonna fly to thailand um and we were playing this place uh under a under a it was pouring rain uh we were playing this little club under a under an overpass in new orleans um and nobody is, nobody was this called them it's called the mermaid lounge. the mermaid lounge so you know this story i've told this Please story a million times and i apologize to anyone who's i mean this is just one of the one of the great world in front of stories i haven't heard it no this is for adam um, there was there was only one employee there and he had just been fired but the own, the owners had told him that he had to do his shift <laughs> And it was pouring rain, so there was no nobody came except for our friends in the circus. Uh, the other characters included uh, Sticks the Clown, who lived in 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 Puro clown outfit, like a white a white clown outfit that was no longer white because it was the only thing he wore, oh, and he had tattooed clown makeup on his face. Um, oh, so he's, he's a nightmare. No, he was a sweetheart, but he looks terrifying. <laughs> I mean, they all looked terrifying. They, they they had this MC who had a he had forked his tongue with a razor blade in a hotel room. And so he had this, he was this Incredible. crazy guy with a with a you know he was he had kind of like a Bill Hicks uh, crossed with cabaret vibe. And he, he, after the after he got out of circus, he went into to being a, a comedian. Eric. <laughs> Amazing, um, actually. But he was incredible. He was another one of the like the great front men I've ever seen. Um, they had a guy who uh, would fillet himself on a bed of nails. That was one of the acts. <laughs> they had a, a lady who would put fish hooks through the piercings holes in her labia and attach a, a six pack to it and sort of swing it back and forth. I mean, it was this kind of act. Yeah. Um, so I don't think they performed that night. They must not have because they were because there were three bands already and there was nobody there. <laughs> but um, but the bartender, the on, the employee got hammered. You know, he'd been fired. He was like, why am I here? You know, I'm just going to. And he passed out on the stage. Do you know why he got fired? No, I, that was that was not my concern. That was none of our concerns. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he had been he was he was he had he had been fired, but was still working, which is, you know, that's just bad management on the on the owner's part but he's sort of like he was trying to break down the stage and he tripped and he fell over and he couldn't get up and he's just sort of like ah it's, 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 take whatever you want and so the <laughs> and so the independence guys got behind the bar and they sort of lined up every shot glass that the bar had across the front of the bar and started i mean it must have been 50 shots worth of whatever they were pouring into it and there were other drugs in the mix and uh, and it was pouring outside and all the windows were open and it was just like, it was like the end of the world. You know, you're in New Orleans and there's no other people for miles around except for these lunatics that you're, that you're trapped in this bar <laughs> with, you know? And yeah, we loaded out. I mean, my, this is one of those stories that has gotten told and retold so many times in World Inferno particularly that I no longer know what the kernels of truth are in it. So I'm just sort of telling you in, in, in true world inferno fashion, like, you know, if, if tell the myth, um, but that we loaded out, we set up an assembly line and essentially loaded out the bar into the, into the three vehicles uh, and then drove to Styx's house, the clown house. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and we, and, and all piled in there, you know, we, we pulled up into this driveway and, you know the 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 bottles were a total loss because of course these they're all stuffed in the wheel well and as soon as you open up the door they all sort of rolled out and smashed all over it everywhere you know there were 15 or 20 of us sleeping in this in this clown punk house and sticks was passed out naked in the in the bathtub when his his sweet little girlfriend was like sticks are you okay um you know <laughs> 
Greg and his girlfriend, who had equally long dreadlocks, were curled curled up, you know, on the tiled kitchen floor under a sleeping bag. So all you could see is these sort of dreadlocks going in every direction under a sleeping bag. I mean, it was it was awesome. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but we we all got up and 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 hit said our goodbyes and hit the road the next day and the the sort of coda is you know we had left all the doors open at this place and we had taken all the all the booze and so the owners were calling Semra's cell phone for the next three weeks being like you guys are criminals we're gonna call ahead and ruin your entire <laughs> tour we're gonna tell everyone what you did they're gonna cancel your show uh you know she's, she's Law, these long furious voicemails and of which you know nothing ever came <laughs> uh but yeah that's our that's our story with the independents i mean we had nothing very little in common with them but, but we shared this bonkers <laughs> tour I, I hope they're doing okay so um i want to talk now about your uh most recent book um someone should pay for your pain am i saying the name right yeah yeah okay this is a novel you wrote. Uh, it was published in 2021. That sounds right. Yeah. Not, this is your second book, but your first novel. Second book, first novel. Yeah. The first book was called The Humorless Ladies of Border Control. And it was about the punk underground in the former communist world between uh, Eastern Europe and, and Mongolia. Oh, okay. I haven't read that book yet. It's on my list. Can you tell me if you uncovered any ska? <laughs> In in the humorless ladies, uh, yes, no, no, no ska bands uh, that I ran across. I don't think. Okay, okay. Back to someone should pay for your pain. <laughs> now, so this book's about a um, aging touring musician who sort of has a you know a, a cult audience, a small cult audience, but the the audience that he has is you know really loves his music but it's not enough to really sustain a real career so he's touring by himself and kind of eking out a living um used to be in a like a bigger band that was kind of like local stars that could have had that potential to get bigger but you know kind of fell apart and then uh, there's also a um like a protege that gets much bigger so i feel like you know you're you're talking a lot about touring and you're talking it's it's got a pretty dark tinge about how rough touring life is and how you know as an artist or musician you kind of you're sort of chasing relevancy and and relevancy is very fleeting so i'm i'm curious a little bit about um you know i think i feel like touring you know it's come up several times in this interview that seems to be a big point of this book um i, I, I so i'm curious about that but but specifically the darkness or the loneliness of it Well, it is lonely and it is tough. I mean, it's physically tough. Um, People have trouble with their hearing. They have trouble with their hands. They they have substance abuse problems. Um, You know, it's it's a little bit thankless uh, a lot of the time. Um, You know, it's hard to it's it's hard to see outside the bubble when you're in when you're in the bubble um and i would meet people sometimes who seemed like they were trapped that they had sort of aaron comic bus uh has this image in his last issue uh which is called um i forget what it's called but it's about it's about sort of revisiting the the, the punks of his generation and the ones who who made it work for them and the ones who didn't um he has this image about like you're running a marathon and all your friends are alongside you and you're all you're all doing this work together and it's hard and it hurts but you're all you're with them and it's and 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 um and then you you're just running and you keep running and all of a sudden you turn around and you're the only one still running and all the everyone has sort of peeled off and and gone to do something else um and i think that there are some people like that you know um who are uh, either because they're so committed to the to the idea and the romance and the idealism of it, um, or because they they got so far out that they don't they don't quite know how to do anything else. Um, you know, there's this sort of mirage like dream of of even reasonably successful music musicians follow a pretty familiar 
career arc, right? You have uh, you have a lot of energy in your twenties. Uh, if if it if it goes real well, that sort of those initial rocket boosters can get you into your thirties. Um, for most people, I think there's a there can be a long fallow period, you know, in your forties and fifties, even but with this idea that one day you'll be rediscovered or that you'll um, that the you know the attention will come. You can be in Amanos, Greece. Uh, you can you know have X, Y, Z will happen, um, but that you don't know that that's going to happen. And in the meantime, you're really going through it. Um, and that's, that's sort of who that character is. I mean, when I was doing that kind of touring, I still had, I wasn't that character. I had a lot of, I had a lot of energy. I was really, you know, I was putting out my email list. I was like giving it all for the five, even if I was playing for five people, but I could see, uh, I wrote it as sort of like a, I, I conceived of it as a little bit of a cautionary tale. Like this is, if I, you know, if I kept doing this, I could end up like this. Kind of mentioned this before, but yeah, it's like you tour long enough. You, you're, you're losing the audience that you had at the same time. You're losing your ability to take a different path in life. Well, sure. I mean, the the hole in your, in your CV is getting wider and wider. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I definitely had that experience. My first, my first child was born and I sort of kept touring for the first year or so, but it was, became obvious that it was going to be unsustainable and unfair and, and, and a little selfish. You know, I could make a living touring by myself because my expenses were low, uh, but it was premised on volume. I would, you know, I was playing 200 shows a year or more. And just to be doing that wasn't fair to my wife or my daughter or, or, or myself. So it was like, okay, I, you know, I gotta, I gotta reinvent my life. Um, but it, wasn't that easy i couldn't you know um my wife and i sort of she got pregnant and we we're like we, we're gonna i guess we'll both apply for jobs and whoever get, gets the job first will be the person with the job <laughs> um and and i just and i didn't realize how hard it was going to be i hadn't had a day job at that point in a decade um so it took a couple of years to sort of reinvent and 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 build that framework back together it's really tough what was that first day job back well like everyone else i got i ended up getting a bartending job Mm. you know because what else are you gonna do Mm -hmm. (laughs) um and i i hadn't bartended in 20 years either but you know you can go into food service i knew how bars worked obviously i knew how to mix some cocktails my jobs when when i before i before the hold steady took off were not food service or bartending jobs. They were, they were office jobs. I worked, I had an advertising job. I worked in for nonprofits, classical music nonprofits. I worked for bang on a can, the the new music organization, but that sort of thing, you know, people who are in the, in the nonprofit world stay in the nonprofit world yeah. you know? and the, the people my age had sort of moved up the ladder and, and I, I couldn't, I was too old to be taking entry level jobs of that sort in fact they weren't they weren't even considering me really they were you know even if i would have taken that job which i would have um i I remember having one interview where the you know i was trying to sell it as like i've been on the road for 10 years it's made me improvisational in in all these ways i can you know i can i can react to whatever gets thrown at me and and he was like, well, can you give me an example of that? And all the examples of it were just like, yeah, <laughs> I'm talking to this Rome, you know, Serbian border agent who wants to take my car apart and look for smuggled cigarettes. It's like, how is that applicable to, <laughs> writing, a, <laughs> to writing grants? <laughs> um, yeah, so I got, a, I got a bartending job at a, uh, at a restaurant, which was actually okay because, you know, Restaurant bartending, you're home at a reasonable hour. Kitchen closes down at ten, and you're home at eleven, eleven thirty. When you started doing before you, before your child was born, when you were doing solo touring, you you transitioned from the hold steady to solo touring. Um, what kind of what kind of um, rooms was was hold steady playing? I mean, hold steady was at the at the peak. So, like, how many people would you say on average were at the shows? It was two or three thousand in in New York or London, uh, or like uh, fifteen hundred in in some other places. I mean, not at all. Like we were still going to like Des Moines and Tucson and 
you know, you, you play for a few hundred people. So what was it like? Did you like the, did you like the shift with the smaller audiences? I did. Yes. And, and, and I'll tell you why. It was because I was looking, I felt like it was, um, that I didn't have to, that I was on autopilot at that, at, by that time with the hold steady, um, that it was too easy to get across that you're protected by the size of the crowd. You're protected by the volume of the band. Um, and that I wasn't sure that I was, uh, challenging myself as a performer. Um, and that the challenge as a performer was going to be, could I go into a room full of strangers by myself with my weird act and convince a room full of strangers that it was worth their while to pay attention to me, that that would be sort of like performer graduate school. And how do you feel like it went? I feel like I graduate. I got a PhD in that. <laughs> I can really do that. You know, Congratulations. <laughs> I can convince a room full of strangers <laughs> to pay attention to me, even if they, even if they, don't care for it, you know, or even if it's not really their thing, I can make it interesting for them. I can identify, I can make eye contact. I can, I can reel them in. I can say, I, I see that you're suspicious of this. Uh, yeah. I'm picking up an accordion, you know, I'm picking up an accordion. I know what you think, blah, 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 whatever, you know, whatever it takes. It was, it's this, the, 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 these old vaudevillians that I was talking about, this idea that you can, you can roll into Hattiesburg or wherever and get up there and you know, do a little soft shoe and tell a joke and maybe sing a song and, you know, whatever it takes to get over. Um, uh, I mean, there was other stuff I was doing around that time. I did, I, sp I spent that year as a hired gun for Against Me, um, which was a lot of fun and very relaxing. It was like, it was cool not to, to be just the, the keyboard player on the side. I didn't have, they, it was like a very stressful time for the band. Um, uh, but I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't implicated in that. And they were a band that, that dealt with a lot of that stuff very privately. Um, so I didn't, I wasn't even aware of a lot of it. Um, I don't know. I was, I was open for business. Like Ari even reached out for me, out to me around that time about playing keys for a couple of weeks on a slackers tour when, when Vic was having some kind of hand problem. Um, it never came together, but you know. That's, I was just like, I want to do, I want to do different things. I actually think what happened to that is, as I told Ara, I was Scott Menable and yeah, I never, and he never asked me about it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I was, I was excited to, and also, I mean, again, like some of this stuff is people who've, who've heard me talk about this time have, have heard some of these, these spiels, but, um, I had run into Matt and Kim, that band. Mm -hmm. uh, they were friend, old friends from like the, you know, Brooklyn DIY days. Uh, and they were on there. We ran into each other on an airport, as, as you do when you're on the sort of touring circuit with people occasionally. They were on their way to Alaska. I was like, oh, that's cool. What are you doing in Alaska? It's like, well, we wanted to do a go on vacation in Alaska. So we just booked a show up there. It's totally backlined. And then... That gives an, you know, then we can write off our whole vacation as, as a, as a business expense. And we use the money from the show to, to pay for this vacation. And that's a little light bulb went off. It's like, well, there's all these kinds of places that I want to go, you know, maybe World Inferno, there were too many people to make it worthwhile to go or like Old Steady's, you know, didn't really have any foothold in, in, in Europe particularly, but that I could, you know, if, if I was by myself, traveling light um i could you know i could go to romania i could go to bulgaria i could go to ukraine um i could go to all these places and play a show and use the and use it all as a tax write-off but also use like the better paying shows in germany and poland to subsidize the break-even shows in some of these more far-fung places that i that i just wanted to go to for the adventure in your book um as, as even though the there was a darkness and a loneliness about it the character's experience. I feel like you kind of wrote about the, the car trips between gigs in a, in a more favorable light. Did you, um, did you enjoy that part of the tours when you were all by yourself? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're sensing that because that's written from very much from my heart. 
I mean, I like driving around with people too, but you know, you got to pick the right road trip partner. Sure. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to commit to, to being in a car with someone for a long period of time, um, especially after I'd been doing it for a couple of years, I really treasured those days driving around by myself. You know, I could go sightseeing. I could go drive, uh, you know, I could go see Hadrian's wall. <laughs> you know, I could go for a hike. I could, I could do whatever I wanted to do. And, you know, I could listen to, I could listen to some kind of abstruse podcast that would drive everyone crazy. I could listen to the entire Prince catalog from top to bottom, uh, including the the records that nobody listens to, uh, just because I was curious, yeah, that sort of thing. And, and yeah, I, you know, I always drove with an open notebook in the passenger seat and a, and a pen there. So I could, I could scribble my impressions without taking my eyes off the road. Um, and a lot of that stuff has made it, you know, made it into both of my books. Um, I think if I could get away with it, I would write entire books of just driving around the world because there's, there's enough material in just in that. Tell me a little bit about your transition to writer. I know you've, you co writing and music coexist in your life. They do now. Yeah. I mean, initially I had, I had thought that I, well, that time we were talking about where I've come off the road. It was really hard for me. I'd only ever identified as a musician. I'd only ever wanted to be a musician. Um, and so to, to confront the idea that that might not be part of my future was brutally difficult. And the only way I could deal with it was like by, by throwing down a hard barrier and saying, okay, I'm no longer a musician and that's just how it's going to be. You know, it's, you know, a little bit like if you're, if you're trying to get sober and you're just like, you, you don't say I'm going to have, <laughs> I mean, I, I think some people do, but the, the, the standard line on it is you can't say, well, I'm just going to have a glass of wine on the weekends. You have to say, no, I, that's just no longer, it's off the table. And so, and so that's sort of what I, I did. Um, I said, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop hustling. I'm going to stop trying to book shows. I'm going to see if anyone notices and that'll be useful information. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, if nobody cares, then that's, then that's good to know. <laughs> then, then I know that it's just been me trying to push this thing. Um, uh, and then, and then I thought, well, I'm going to go back to school. It's either going to be, it's either going to be, I'm going to follow up this writing thing and pursue another financially irresponsible creative career, but one at, le at least I can do from home, um, or go get a library sciences degree and be a, be a librarian. That had always been sort of my dream alternate job. One of those classical music nonprofits that I used to work for had a scores library that lived at the performing arts collection at, uh, at Lincoln Center, and part of my job was once a week to go there and dig out some of these scores and copy them and send them to members. And I just, it was such a blissful, quiet, alone time um, that I always, you know, my friends who are librarians tell me that it's not actually like that, but <laughs> this romantic <laughs> idea of just being like, being like alone with books uh, <laughs> really stuck in my head. Um, and I had started teaching. I had sort of started teaching as an adjunct at Bard College and I, I sort of liked it. Um, but I needed a degree if I was going to really do more of it. Um, some sort of terminal graduate degree. Um, and my wife's an academic, so it made sense for me to try to get a job where our s schedules matched up, um, in that way and where my job could travel with her job if she was, if she was getting, if, you know, if she, if she got other job offers. Um, I've sort of lost track of the thread of the question. <laughs> oh, writing. Writing. Uh, I, yeah. I had been writing, uh, you know, I'd been keeping tour diaries all along, publishing them in various forms here and there, writing various articles, and just sort of exp writing longer and longer pieces until it seemed like it was, I had sort of put, done a chat book of short stories which was put out, here's a funny coincidence, by the same guy who did the sublime GQ article <laughs> that you referenced earlier, Jay mm. Diamond. Is that how, I mean, so I guess he, you guys were friends. Is that why he interviewed you? He, we've been friends for, for a long time. He, 
interviewed me for a magazine. We met because he interviewed me from around my first solo record. Okay. We sort of hit it off, and he was running a reading series out of a bar in Greenpoint, um, a sort of rollicking reading series with a lot of writers who've gone on to, to big things. Um, and he invited me to, to, he did one that was like three minute rock and roll stories, like come on and tell your best tour story. And then one that was like, and then, and then, uh, one that was more of like a short story reading that I wrote something for. And then he was trying to, he had this scheme about doing, putting together like a, a small press that did chat books. And he asked me if I wanted to put together a few stories and, and anyway, that's what that was. Um, but he's moved up in the publishing world and, and um, has a couple books of great books of his own. Um, and I don't know why he reached out to me about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of his like musician contacts, I guess. Got to get the, got to get your take on sublime on sublime. And, but anyway, it just seemed like attempting a book length. He was also, he had commissioned me to do a thing about subhumans that was like one of the longest things I had mm. written up until that point. That was probably 08, 09 when, when the subhumans, um, uh, all those reissues came out. Mm -hmm. That's another one of my treasured punk points. I'm the only person I'm pretty sure who ever played accordion with subhumans on stage. Well, let's, when did you do that? Uh, oh, uh, Inferno toured with them a bunch and, and I would get up and do work, rest, play, die, um, on accordion. I, th I think there's accordion. I accordion on the i think there's accordion on the recording but they had never they had never done it that way live uh-huh yeah um after your time in world inferno the i think 2016 or so they toured with uh culture shock yeah yep yeah that would have been that would have been a great uh show to see i mean that whole world subhumans culture shocks Citizen and fish is is so cool and I, um, just the, the, the ideal, I don't know what, I don't know what, what the word is just they're, they're the real thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They, and to just keep it so real, uh, keeping it real it almost seems like too weak of a phrase for those folks to be doing it, uh, for so long like that is, is, is so amazing. So you, one of the articles you wrote, um, this was probably like four or five years ago. Um, this is back to the idea of like your, um, the idea, the idea in the world of touring, taking up, um, you know, significant space in your brain and you thinking about it is that you wrote an article about how bands as, they, as they've been aging and having families have been figuring out ways to take their whole family or their, specifically their kids on tour with them. Yeah. Interesting. It was an interesting article. Um, what was your, um. What was your takeaway from that? I mean, it seems like it seems like musicians are in a tough spot. <laughs> like, do you go, you know, it's a lot easier to tour without your family, but it's very there's a lot of things about being a musician that's disastrous to having a personal life and to yes. and to be an artist or musician and to maintain your um personal relationships. It requires a lot more work. Yeah, I mean, so you're talking I wrote this article for Slate some years ago about musicians who tour with their kids. Um, and there, you know, there's a, there's a class divide there, you know, there's the people, there's the people who can afford to bring a nanny. Um, uh, and then there were, you know, there's been professional sort of touring nanny companies set up for exactly that purpose. Um, and then there are the, the, the DIY folks, you know, the path not taken, like I was talking about before, had I tried to stay on the road in that way, um, you know, people who have done that and tried to uh, maintain and, and bring their kids, right? Not not like I'm going to leave my kids for for 200 days a year, but but I'm actually going to involve them in this adventure. Um, and some of those, like like Truck Stop Honeymoon or uh, Mates of State or um, who else, uh, Fawn Fables. You know, there's a couple involved in the band mom and dad are in the band um and they have all these uh so the 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 challenge of dealing with having your kids in the van and your kids at the club is in some ways no greater than the challenge of just being a parent anyway 
Um, but you, but you have your kids with you and you're exposing them to all these interesting adventures and, and so on. You know, this guy, Hamill on trial is, is a really heartwarming story, you know, about essentially it's his, what, what he did, got to do is have a summer long road trip with his son every year from when his son was seven or eight years old until now when he's a, you know, a college student or maybe even graduated from college at this point. And just like as a father son bonding experience, it sounds like it was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, people do it. I haven't tried, but (laughs) God bless people, people who do. My daughter is coming down for the hold steady shows at Brooklyn bowl in a couple of weeks. And she's really excited for that. Um, I mean, it, 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 the the main challenge up until now has been like we don't go on until nine thirty or yeah. ten and she's she's not awake at that point so this will be this will be the test you know she's nine years old she's she can I think she can stay up till eleven or midnight now uh, I know she can judging from her sleepovers <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that's that's I think that's in in many ways the biggest challenge is like who can put the kids to bed if set time is ten or eleven or twelve yeah. Should we bring back matinee shows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listen, man, I'm all for, I, I'm 45 years old. I'm ready for early. Sh- I, I love an early show. Yeah. Uh, the UK has this tradition from the days when the, the bars, when, when last call was at 11, I think 11 or midnight where, you know, shows at seven shows at seven thirty. shows at headliners at eight. Um, and they've still sort of, re- you know, last call is much later now. But they've retained this uh, this sort of vestigial sense that the show starts early, um, and I, I love that because then you can go out afterwards. You know, er, early show after party for anybody who wants to stay up all night. Yeah, you want to rage, you want to hang out at the bar, you can do that after that. Get a DJ. Yeah, headliner at eight, shows over by ten. You can still go out for two hours and be home at a reasonable hour. Like I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know why more American uh, venues can't can't get on board with that. They just want to keep keep people there as long as they can and keep them drinking as long as they can, and they they think that people will leave. I don't think that logic makes you sense. Know, I don't though, if the show doesn't start till nine, you know that they're just not going to get there till nine. Yep. Whereas, like, if you okay, so the show's over at ten, you can keep the bar open if people don't want to leave. Yeah, this way it's just the show ends and they want to kick everybody out. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sure there are justifications that by by people who are in that business that um that make perfect business sense that I I just don't have access to. But for our venue owners that are listening to this podcast, <laughs> do the right thing. <laughs> I mean, for God's sake, if it's if it's a hold steady show, you know. Yeah. It's not, it's not like we have the youngest fan base in the world. I know. Can we at least scale it? to the uh fan base age yeah <laughs> <laughs> right that's okay the band is 23 and it's all their friends that you they can they can play an 11 o'clock set yeah they can go on at 1 a.m if they want <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what being 23 is for sure yeah yeah Thank you so much for listening to In Defense of Ska. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you normally stream or download episodes. If you haven't already, grab a copy of my book, In Defense of Ska, available at clashbooks.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. It's at In Defense of Ska. And please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com backslash in defense of ska you will get monthly bonus episodes extended interviews and commentary per episode and access to the in defense of ska discord in defense of ska would not be possible without the great team that tirelessly works on it every week so you should go check out their other projects as well co-host adam davis has an amazing band called omnigon give them a follow on instagram and twitter It's simply at Omnigo. And our editor, Chris Reeves, has a phenomenal record label and podcast called Ska Punk International. For more information, go to skapunkinternational.com. 
And if you've ever enjoyed one of the highly specific in defense of ska memes floating around the interwebs, it was likely the work of the bands I like only charge $18. Find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On that note, we leave you by saying ska now more than ever. He's in the hold steady. That's wild. Yeah. He's still in the hold steady? He's still in the hold steady. He wasn't in hold steady. He for was while, in the hold stand. In the, he was in the hold steady. He is in the hold steady. He will always be in the hold steady. Hey. But if you want to hear us talk more, head over to the Patreon. We don't talk about the hold steady so much as we talk about the trials and tribulations of being a modern touring musician, which... Franz knows a lot about. Uh, it's, it's kind of the topic of his novel. He's written some Marvel calls about it. He, his first book kind of talks sort of about that. So we, we get into it. Yeah. You want to hear bucks. us talk to him about that? Yeah. Five bucks. Head on over. You'll be supporting us. You'll be supporting the podcast. Really, you'll just be supporting the podcast. You don't get any money from this. Yeah. Just support the podcast so that we can support. keep making it. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Who do we got next week? Next week, we have our friend Sammy K. Holy shit. That's going to be an episode. It's going to be a fun one. Yeah. Make sure you subscribe, like, find us on all the socials. Uh, We'll see you soon.